3 minutes, nummer 1563, met een uitzending van vandaag, 2 maart 2019. Ik merk dat mijn stem een beetje schor is. Dit is het bulletin van zaterdag. Today's bulletin will be largely in English. Data op de achtergrond is het VSA RTTY bulletin van vandaag. Je kunt dat tijdens het geluid op DMRLI decoderen door die. Nou, je kunt dit uh, tijdens het geluid op DMR.li decoderen door FL Digi op Contestia 4 schuine streep 125 te zetten bij 64 hertz. Contestia 4 schuine streep 125 bij 64 hertz. Dat werkt alleen op DMR.li, dus niet als je deze uitzending op YouTube beluistert. Ja, en er is nog een tweede blok data aan het eind van deze uitzending. Dat is shortwave radiogram van dit weekend, zoals ik dat vanmiddag van 9400 kilohertz heb ontvangen. Ik heb grotendeels niet meegeluisterd, dus ik weet niet of de hele uitzending goed ontvangen is. Maar dat is misschien ook wel een uitdaging. We beginnen vandaag met het nieuws van de RSGB in de versie van TX Factor. Die was beschikbaar. En daarna is er nog een item van de dokters in van de RSGB. En die gaat over de Raspberry Pi. Hello, this is Mike Marsh, G1IAR, and welcome to the TX News podcast of the GB2RS National News for Sunday, the 3rd of March 2019, supplied by the Radio Society of Great Britain and brought to you by TX Factor. The news headlines this week prepare for Commonwealth Contest next weekend, suggest talks for RSGB Convention 2019, and ham radio artwork returns to the Tate Gallery. The Commonwealth Contest, the RSGB's longest-running contest, takes place for 24 hours over the weekend of the 9th and the 10th of March. As mentioned in the propagation report, which we'll get to later, you shouldn't expect much propagation on the upper HF bands, but some hardy travellers will undoubtedly activate countries that don't appear on the air every day. So make the most of it. Planning has begun for the 2019 RSGB convention, which will take place from Friday the 11th to Sunday the 13th of October at Kent's Hill Park Training and Conference Centre in Milton Keynes. The organising committee would like to encourage suggestions for this year's lectures and please email convention at rsgb.org.uk in particular if you're able to suggest a presenter as well as a topic. And the RSGB convention is generously sponsored by Martin Lynch and Sons. The artwork 10-minute transmission featuring the Kenwood TS-2000 transceiver and the International Space Station is again on display at the Tate Gallery in London. Made of wire and attached to the TS-2000, this sculpture receives radio signals from the ISS and transmits them into the gallery space. The title of this work, 10-Minute Transmission, refers to the period of time when the ISS can be contacted as it flies past overhead. Although the ISS orbits the Earth every 90 minutes, it only passes close enough to the artwork to receive any signals just twice a day. Check out the website at Tate dot org dot uk for all the other details about the exhibit two videos of the 2018 rsgb convention lectures are due for release to members this week sam jewell golf for delta delta kilo speaks about the iceni a high performance 70 centimeter transverter for the constructor and james patterson mike one delta sierra tango gives an introduction to 3d printing for amateur radio go check out the website at rsgb.org slash videos where you will find not only these two very interesting talks but many other ones too stations taking part in the saint patrick award will be on the air from noon on the 16th of march to noon on the 18th of march this year a new digital award has been added covering such modes as ft8 dmr d star jt56 and echo link and to claim it you must have made at least 20 contacts with a registered saint patrick's day station and if you'd like some more information why don't you head over to the website at saint patrick award that's all one word saint patrick award dot webs dot com 
The provisional results for the last IARU Region 1 145 MHz contest have been published. In the multi-operator 145 MHz section, Golf 8 Papa was placed third, operating from Juliet Oscar 01 Quebec Delta, and Golf 8 Tango was placed ninth, operating from Juliet Oscar 01 Kilo Juliet. Full details can be found on the webpage at iaiu-r1.org. Cumbran and District ARS now have a local SSTV repeater. Classed as a regenerative node, it will relay and repeat a received image. Mike Bravo 7 Tango Romeo is situated in Cumbran and it's maintained by Peter Mike Whiskey Zero Romeo Papa Bravo. It operates on 144.500 MHz using FM and it outputs in the Martin 1 SSTV mode. Now, to get it to repeat your transmitted image, which incidentally can be transmitted in any SSTV mode on 145.500 MHz in FM, you transmit your CW ident, then a 1750 Hz tone burst for around 1 to 2 seconds, and then you finally key off. Then you listen and you wait for Mike Bravo 7 Tango Romeo to reply with its CW ident and this signifies it's ready so that you can transmit your SSTV image. Those using the repeater wish to thank Peter for all his work on this. That is your headline news. Now it's time for details of rallies and events for the upcoming week. Sunday the 3rd of March, it's the Exeter Radio and Electronics Rally. It takes place at America Hall on the Delarue Way in Pinho in Exeter. Postcode is Echo X-Ray 4 8 Papa Whiskey. The doors open at 10.30 in the morning. Disabled customers gain access at 10.15. It'll cost you £2 to get in, with under-16s getting in free. There'll be trade stands and a bring and buy and catering is available on site if you'd like some more details get in touch with pete golf 3 zulu victor india on his mobile which is 07714 374 and next sunday the 10th of march the grantham arc radio and electronics rally takes place at the grantham west community center on the trent road in grantham which is in lincolnshire of course and the postcode is november golf 31 7 x-ray whiskey doors are open from 9 30 in the morning to 3 p.m in the afternoon and admission is three pounds there will be trade stands an rsgb bookstall and special interest groups and catering is available on site if you'd like some more information get in touch with kevin burton golf six sierra sierra november on his mobile zero seven seven nine three one four two four eight three and don't forget to get your event into radcom and onto gp2rs and on the rsgb website please send your details in as early as you possibly can to radcom at rsgb.org.uk and we need to know about four months in advance for radcom Moving on to the DX News now from 425DX News and other sources. Don Golf 3 X-Ray Tango Tango will be active as Charlie 56 Delta Foxtrot from the Gambia from the 5th to the 12th of March. Main activity will be during the RSGB Commonwealth Contest on the 9th and the 10th, but he does hope to do some operating also before and after the contest. It's a CW-only operation, low power with wires from a rooftop apartment and it's likely that there will be space for 80 or 160 metre antennas. If you get a contact, QSL via Logbook of the World, Club Logs OQRS or direct to his home call. Ali Echo Papa 3 Charlie Quebec will be on the air as 6 Oscar 1 Oscar Oscar from Somalia until the 24th of March. Usually he operates FT8 on the 20 metre band and his activity is limited to spare time but you might catch him on the air so QSL with details on qrz.com. Dom Mike 1 Kilo Tango Alpha will be active as Charlie 6 Alpha Kilo Tango from Eleuthera Island, which is IOTA reference November Alpha 001, in the Bahamas. Between the 8th and the 16th of March, he'll be operating CW on 80, 40, 20, 15 and 10 metres and will participate in the Commonwealth Contest. QSL via Club Logs OQRS or via his home call. 
Dagmar, Delta Mike 7, Papa Quebec, and Rainer, Delta Lima 1, Alpha Uniform Zulu, will be active as Echo 51, November Papa Quebec, and Echo 51, Alpha Uniform Zulu, respectively, from Raro Tonga, which is Oscar Charlie 013, in the South Cook Islands between the 9th and the 11th of March, holiday styly. They will be operating CW only. And finally, look out for Kilo Go 4 Sierra Charlie and Kilo Go 4 Alpha Sierra, who will be operating SSB, CW and FT8 and possibly some other digital modes from Guantanamo Bay between the 6th and the 13th of March. QSL as per their instructions on QRZ.com. All right, moving on to the special events news now, and here's a long special event call sign if ever I saw one. Tango Charlie 10 Golf India Tango Romeo Alpha Delta TC10 Gitrad. That's the special call sign for the Girison Radio Amateurs and National Sports Association to celebrate their 10th anniversary. Be fun filling in the logbook and putting the call out on the air quickly. Uh, they will be active until the end of the year. And if you do get a contact, QSL via Logbook of the World, EQSL, or direct via the Bureau. And if you've got any special event details that you want airing to the world, you can get those sent to us at radcom at rsgb.org.uk. Send them in as early as possible. You'll get free publicity on GB2RS in Radcom and online as well. And remember that UK stations with special event call signs must be open to the public, so our free publicity can help your efforts get more widely known. Moving on to the contest news now. This weekend, the 144432 megahertz contest ends its 24-hour run at 1400 UTC on Sunday the 3rd. Using all modes on both bands, the exchanges signal report, serial number and locator. The ARRL International DX Contest ends its 48-hour run at 23.59 UTC on Sunday the 3rd. Using 1.8 to 28 MHz contest bands, the exchanges signal report and transmit power. And American and Canadian stations will also give their state or their province. Sunday the 3rd, the UK Microwave Group's Low Band Contest runs from 1000 to 1600 UTC. Using all modes on the 1.3 to 3.4 GHz bands, the exchange is signal report, serial number and locator. On Monday, the 80 meter club championship runs 2000 to 2130 UTC. This is the data leg and the exchange is signal report and serial number. On Tuesday, the 144 MHz FM activity contest runs 1900 to 2000 UTC using FM only. It runs concurrently with the machine generated mode activity contest where the exchange is signal report, serial number and locator. Now these are immediately followed by the all-mode 144 UK activity contest and that runs from 2000 to 2230. The exchange for this one though is signal report, serial number and locator. On Wednesday, the UK EI Contest Club event will be on the 80 metre band between 2000 and 2100 UTC and the exchange is your four character locator. Next weekend, as mentioned before, the RSGB Commonwealth Contest, it runs 1000 UTC on the 9th to 1000 UTC on the 10th. It's CW only on the 3.5 to 28 MHz bands with the exchange, signal report and serial number. HQ stations will also need to send their HQ. On Sunday the 10th, the second 70 MHz cumulative contest runs from 1000 to 1200 UTC. Using all modes, the exchanges signal report, serial number and locator. And finally, the Worked All Britain 3.5 MHz contest takes place next Sunday the 10th of March from 1800 to 2200 UTC. Entries need to be with the contest manager by the 31st and the exchange will be RS plus serial number plus WAB square. Check out the website for more details at worked-all-britain.org.uk. And wrapping up the main news now, it is the propagation report compiled this week by Golf Zero Kilo Yankee Alpha, Golf 3 Yankee Lima Alpha and Golf 4 Bravo Alpha Oscar on Friday the 1st of March. The settled sun came to an abrupt end on Thursday when the KP index 
rose to five as a result of an elongated coronal hole on its surface. This sparked high-latitude auroras. It brought an end to a period of settled conditions, with the Chiltern Ionoson showing MUF struggling to reach much above 14 MHz on Thursday morning. Before this, there was DX to be had if you stuck with it. Chris, Golf Zero, Delta, Whiskey Victor, reports working Tango 31 Echo Uniform in central Kiribati on 40 metres CW at 1750. Another DX station that was sought after was Fox Hotel slash Uniform Alpha 4, Whiskey Mike Hotel X-Ray on May Yacht, which is off the coast of Madagascar, which was worked on many HF bands by Mike, Golf or Delta, Yankee Charlie during the week. Both Hawaii and Peru were also worked on 40 metres in the morning by Andy Mike Zero November Kilo Romeo. Now, next weekend, it's the Commonwealth Contest with lots of stations on the air, so do make the most of it, but don't expect much above 14 megahertz. NOAA has the solar conditions settled until Friday the 8th of March when it expects the KP index to rise to four or more due to a coronal hole. Now, this should be a relatively short-lived thing as it should die down again shortly afterwards and the solar index is pegged solidly at 71, so no surprises there. As we head into March, expect conditions to improve slightly with better DX, although the lower bands may suffer more with daylight. This is a great time for north-south paths such as the UK to South Africa and the UK to South America. Moving up the band now, let's take a look at the VHF and upwards propagation news. We've now seen the end of the extended tropo weather we've been enjoying and are now in a very unsettled Atlantic weather pattern. Weather systems moving towards the British Isles will bring stronger winds and periods of rain or showers, so it's hard to pinpoint a good weather propagation mode in this pattern, other than some occasional gigahertz bands with some rain scattered from showers or the more active cold fronts that happen to pass by. As usual, there are many good radar displays which can allow you to pick up the most intense echoes. Without Tropo to boost the activity and still too early for traditional sporadic E, pickings might be a little bit on the thin side. However, with such strong jet streams on the charts, especially across the Atlantic, there's always a remote chance for a brief 28 megahertz path, but I wouldn't take a day off work for it. Meteor scatter conditions are still quiet until April, so just random meteors to keep us interested there. The moon is at apogee tomorrow, that's Saturday, and last Friday saw minimum declination. This week we have a daytime moon and a week of lengthening moon windows with falling losses. And that is it from the propagation team for this week. And that is all we've got for your GB2RS national news for the UK from around the world this week. Don't forget you can try and catch up with your regional GB2RS news, the news that's important close to you at home. You can track down your local GB2RS newsreader by finding them on the air. And if you don't know who's doing it across the country every Sunday, why don't you grab the PDF file from the TX Factor website, which gives you all the details of all the broadcasters up and down the country. If you're not sure who they are or where they are, head over to txfactor.co.uk. Click on that GB2RS news tab on the top of the homepage. And then if you look into that, you can grab yourself an up-to-date PDF of all the broadcasters and when they are on the air. I'm Mike Marsh, G1IAR, reporting with the TX News weekly podcast of GB2RS. Thank you for listening. We will see you back here next week with a fresh edition of GB2RS News. This is The Doctor Is In, your bi-weekly podcast that discusses all things technical and not so technical. The Doctor Is In podcast is produced by ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, and sponsored by DX Engineering, helping you shrink the globe. See their website at www.dxengineering.com. Hello and welcome to The Doctor Is In. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and I have a guest with me today, and that is Mr. Joe Karsha, NJ1Q. And Joe's title here at ARRL headquarters in Newington is the W1AW station manager. But I have a feeling that a lot of you have no idea what W1AW is or why it needs a manager, right, Joe? I mean, tell them uh, it. Exactly. 
Well, W1AW is the Maxim Memorial Station. It is named after our founder and first president, Hiram Percy Maxim, who was originally licensed as 1AW. And this station is here in honor of Hiram Percy Maxim. Right across the parking lot. Correct, yes. Yeah. It's a little brick building. If you've ever seen it in any publication, QST or otherwise, or even just online, it's a little brick building. And what we do at the station is we provide code practice and bulletin transmissions over nine HF and VHF frequencies simultaneously. We do that as a service to all amateur radio operators, not just the membership. Right. The station is there for ham radio operators. We also provide three spots for visiting hams to come in and operate the station. Now, before we get on to our primary topic, I, there's one other thing I wanted to bring up, mm -hmm. and that is we have a new podcast coming up. Uh, this particular podcast will air on February 28th, or will, will be released on February 28th. Mm -hmm. The week following, on March 7th, uh, we're going to debut a brand new podcast called So Now What? And you're going to be featured on that podcast. Yes, I am. So Now What? is our new podcast that is directed to brand new amateur trader operators. In this case, specifically technicians, although you can be a brand new general or even an extra class ham, but it's directed to brand new radio operators. And it's going to be very basic in the beginning. Now, you've gone as a ham, you've gone through the licensing process, you've read the manuals and you've taken the test and so on, but a lot of hams find that they just, they just don't know where to start, where to begin. Maybe they're having a problem finding a mentor or a local club. So it's like, well, what do I do? I have this license. It's the proverbial, so now what? Right. This is really targeting new hams. This is targeting new hams. So the, the veteran ham may find our talk a little banal, a little, a little boring. Because, a little too basic. A little yes. too basic, very basic, because I'm sure in their mind they're saying, yeah, but I already know this stuff. Well it's not directed towards you. I mean, we would love you to listen, but it's not directed towards you. This is directed towards new hams. And I am the quote unquote veteran ham that is on <laughs> this podcast. Uh, Michelle Patnode, my partner in crime, her call is uh, Whiskey 3, Mike Victor Papa, uh, is representing the new ham because she is a relatively newly licensed ham who, is, who has been active. She has gotten on the air. We actually threw her into the deep end during field day last year. But she, too, is still in New Ham, so it's going to be a little bit of a learning experience for her. And I'm going to be there answering questions, uh, talking a little bit about what you can do in ham radio. And, of course, we are also asking for questions from our audience. And we'll try to answer those questions. And while I might be the, the veteran in this, I'm certainly not the shell answer man. So if we need sure. a question answered, we may go outside. We'll go to the laboratory. We'll go to somebody else here. We'll, we'll maybe have guests coming in to answer questions or give some talks about amateur radio or even propagation or contesting. Mm -hmm. So this is something that, uh, like our, our other podcasts, listeners can find on iTunes, on Stitcher, if you're an Android user, yeah. on Blueberry, which yes. is our, our host for the podcast. And I would encourage, personally, I know a lot of our listeners are veteran amateurs. I would encourage them to tell new hams about this thing, uh, tell them about the podcast, and encourage them to uh, go find it and listen to it. Exactly, because while we're coming up with a format, we're coming up with questions and topics of discussion the fact remains is we can only come up with so much stuff we may have a lot of information but there might be a question out there that we haven't thought of a new ham could say well what about this and we're thinking well yeah we never thought about that so let's investigate that and we'll try to answer the question for them so we have set up an email address it's so now what at arl.org we also have a web page, which will soon be available, which essentially is off the ARL.org web page. And there's a small form on there that you can use to ask your questions as well. Excellent. Well, Joe, why don't we move on to our, to our real 
purpose for being here. <laughs> the, pr- the purpose of being here, The yes. purpose for being here is to talk about the amazing raspberry pie. I, I love the pie. I love the pie, yep. too. I've... I had several uh, during my ham career, mm-hmm. and, they, and they haven't been around all that long. Yep. For people who have never heard of these things, would it be fair to say, Joe, that the Raspberry Pi is essentially a microcomputer? Yes. But it's a full-fledged computer. I mean, it has USB ports. It has an HDMI video port that you can plug into a monitor. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's got a slot for a memory card has uh, audio output. I don't know if it has input or not. Yes. But it has um, audio output. If you took this thing backward in time, about 10 years, it would probably be as powerful as many of the uh, laptops that were running around at, at that time. Exactly. The current model, I believe, is a 3B. Yes, a 3B. And I actually have one of the first threes, the Raspberry 3, which came with built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And essentially it is. It's a very small microcomputer. Now, for those of you who are thinking, great, I can run my Microsoft stuff on it. Well, not necessarily. (laughs) (laughs) It uses uh, Linux in a form of Linux um, called Raspbian because it's a Raspberry Pi. Although I'm partial to Blueberry, but, you know, Raspberry is still cool. Raspberry? Raspberry is good. Raspberry Pi. And it uses a micro SD card, which you have to burn with a Linux image. Think Uh, of it as your hard drive. Yes, it's the hard drive. You pull that little micro SD card out, and the thing's a paperweight. Yeah. But you would have to burn the image on the micro USD using Raspbian or Stretch. That's the other one. I believe there is an Ubuntu version. It's all Linux, and you have to kind of know a little bit of Linux to get this thing to work properly. Now... Before you think that, oh, great, I have to learn Linux, I have to learn code. Well, that's kind of true to get the thing started. Somewhat. Somewhat. But it does have a GUI or a graphic user interface that you can use. And it kind of sort of looks like Windows. So if you're comfortable in that environment, you can do it. It looks very much like Windows. The, The first time I ever powered up a Raspberry Pi... I was using, you're right, I was using Raspbian, uh, it's called Raspbian Jesse. Actually, yeah, Jesse, yep. And it was on the micro SD card, you're mm-hmm. right. When I powered that thing up, I was astonished at how much it looked like Windows. Yes. It really did, and was remarkably easy to use, because mm-hmm. if you've used Windows, you can use this thing. It has icons on the screen and, and so on. Correct. And when it comes to installing software, it's a little... It's a little hairy because it's not just a standard go to a website and download a, an executive file and run it and so on and so forth, or even a zip file. But there are certain variations to that when it comes to running software. Now, our listening audience cannot see it, but uh, but it's really, it's here, honestly. <laughs> I have my Raspberry Liar. Pi. <laughs> if only I can show you. I have my Raspberry Pi 3. I call it a Pi Top. And what I had done was I had taken an old laptop monitor, bought a video driver card for it on Amazon, hooked that up to my Raspberry Pi, and I have it now running in the background with its GUI interface. And I'm running FL Digi, which is a multi-mode digital program, and I can control that using VNC over my iPhone. So I can actually tell it to run different programs via my iPhone, and it, for me, it runs as a great amateur radio application because yes. it's essentially it is a microcomputer with the USB ports on it and uh, the size of the memory card. You can load a lot of stuff into it. So for those who are experimenting, the Pi is just one way to do it. Yes, you have your Arduino out there. You have your regular laptops, your regular computers. But for those who want to play with the Raspberry Pi to see what the applications are, I would recommend they try that. Now, the Arduino, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Joe, the Arduino, powerful and capable as it is, is really just a processor. Whereas the the Raspberry Pi, once again, is a full-fledged, real computer. Exactly. With an Arduino, you can run switching programs. You can have it swap antennas and and change relays, and you can have it control all sorts of different things. You can have it monitor signal levels and voltage levels and so on. And that's where the Arduino was powerful. Here, you're actually looking at a small microcomputer. 
Yes. And if you don't mind putting all the extra stuff to it, like a keyboard, like Well, I was going to get to that, yes. Mine, and this is the cool thing about the, the current technology, it doesn't have a keyboard, obviously, but it has multiple USB ports, and you can plug in a mouse, you can plug in a keyboard, or you can do like what I had done, get a wireless keyboard and mouse, put the little dongle in there, and now I can control it from up to 32 feet. I believe the, um, the Raspberry Pi 3B has Bluetooth on it already. Yes. Uh, my This one has, the one I have, which is the 3, has Bluetooth built into it. So and you wireless. could use a wireless keyboard, wireless mouse right there with it. Correct, yes. You would have to compile it in there and set it up to where it sees that Bluetooth keyboard and yes. mouse. Yep. Now, you will need a monitor of some Correct. sort. yes. And, and that might be the most expensive part of the whole package. I And I, I don't mean to scare anyone away. I'm mm-hmm. just saying you need, at the very least, uh, some sort of small monitor that you can plug into it. But then monitors are getting awfully inexpensive nowadays. Exactly. The only thing is that it has to be an HDMI monitor. Yes, must be HDMI. Correct. Or if you don't have an HDMI monitor, you can always get to the HDMI to VGA converter yes. and plug that in and use a VGA monitor and that'll work just as well i've done that in the past and the video is just as clean as if you had a regular hdmi monitor right for the one i have here the video driver board has hdmi and vga and actually composite so all i've done is i've just plugged the pi into that controller board and then it's just dumping the video up onto the screen okay Joe, let's take a break for a second. We will come back and talk about the uh, the economics of the pie, so to speak. Ever talk to a salesperson who didn't know the difference between a rotator and a rotary phone? Or a Yagi and a yo-yo? Or a ballon and a ballerina? You'll never have that problem with DX Engineering. When you call us, you'll talk directly with knowledgeable amateur radio experts, people who speak your language. When you contact DX Engineering, you're dealing with operators who are as passionate about the hobby as you are. This means better service, expert technical advice, and a commitment to your complete satisfaction, even long after your purchase has been made. Whether you're newly licensed or a long-time operator, you'll always find a friendly ham who understands exactly what you need on the other end of the line. Plus, you'll find a huge selection of amateur radio equipment, Get the fastest shipping in the ham universe, and shipping is free on most orders over $99. Let's talk about your station. Visit us at dxengineering.com. That's dxengineering.com. And we're back. And as promised, when I said economics, I mean, (laughs) you know, the basics. How much does this thing cost? And it's actually remarkably inexpensive. I, I think the peripheral stuff... The monitor might be more expensive than the Pi itself. I've seen it on Amazon in the form of kits. Yes. By, by kits, now, I don't mean that you assemble the Pi, but I mean a kit where it comes with a little power supply, mm-hmm. the Pi itself, a little cabinet or enclosure to put the Pi in, and sometimes even the micro SD cards are, are included with that. Yeah. Correct me here, Joe, but I've seen those... Oh, I think in the vicinity of $70 for the whole thing. Is that right? If that, yes. Uh, when I purchased mine, I got mine through Amazon. It was $35. 35 bucks. It was 35 bucks. But wow. But it was just the pie and the little plastic case it comes in. Now, I had to go out and I bought an SD card. And depending on what you want to do, you might be able to get away with maybe an 8 gig SDI card. I have in mind a 64 gig because I knew I would be installing a number of amateur radio applications. That's what I did too. So I got a large card and that works great. But between the card and it's hard to pick a price on that because I can go to Staples, get an Amazon, you can go to Walmart. There's a number of places where you yeah. can buy these. The, the Well, it's the micro SD card. Yes. But it's so you can't say, well, it's definitely going to cost you this much. But if you have the monitor ready, VGA or HDMI and the Pi, and you don't mind running a wireless keyboard or if you have a regular wired keyboard and mouse, it's, I would say, under $100 oh, for easily, all of it yes. easily. It's yeah, depending on the monitor. That, that might Correct. be, again, the, I mean, if you want something nice, if you want a, 
20 inch 30 inch monitor then yeah you're going to pony up about 200 bucks or more for that exactly yes uh, but if you want something small i've seen on amazon mm -hmm. i've seen seven inch seven or ten inch hdmi monitors going for about a hundred bucks now yes and the nice thing about the pi is that you can actually buy a small seven inch touch screen yes i forgot to mention that, that connects right to the pi yes and you can kind of control it like your phone your iphone or your I sh no i shouldn't say iphone i should say what is it electronic device electronic yes, electronic phone. <laughs> mobile device <laughs> mobile yes. device mobile <laughs> device um you can control it like your mobile device or an ipad or anything like that with the touch screen yeah and the cool thing about the Pi is that it doesn't necessarily use the HDMI port. There's actually two slots that are on the Pi where you would actually plug these screens into because you are using the touchscreen aspect of it. Yes. And you can buy these plastic housings that have the Pi installed inside of it, and then the monitor, that small screen, fits on top of that so you're, oh that's very cute so you're looking yes. at this little it's cute it's very <laughs> cute you're looking at this little pie with a little seven inch touch screen and you can just kind of sit there and do the stuff you need obviously it's going to use its power supply it's a five volts uh, the micro usb which kind of plugs in off the side so you're going to be tethered that way mm -hmm. but you essentially have the small little portable computer in front of you and you can even pull up the keypad or the keyboard i should say with the pie on that screen and when we say small i mean tell them it's about what three by four inches a, something like yeah, that yeah it's about three by four inches very low profile now there are a few things if you think back to your mobile device i'll get the right terminology this yes. time or your computer they have internal clocks so the clock setting is automatically done for you with the pie there is no way for it to do that on its own if it's just sitting there it doesn't keep time that being said you can get a small hat the Pi clock that plugs into the expansion pins on top of it now when you say hat what do you the, mean the hat is the, um, it's not a, a fedora no not, not a fedora it, it's a very small board which uh, they used to call them shields which fits right over the pins that are on there there's yes. a uh, 26 pin yep. card and essentially what this does this sends keying signals and information to the raspberry pi and it's a very small board that has a small battery on it that essentially keeps the time and that keeps the time for the pi so every time you turn on the pi it looks to that board and says oh, okay here's the current time and it sets itself now the nice thing about the Pi is let, let's assume that you have it connected and it knows a Wi-Fi someplace, your home or your office. When it boots up, it will look for a time server and adjust its time. Well, what if you're not in the proximity of a Wi-Fi system, but you need to keep time? You're out in the field. Well, having this little Pi clock attached keeps that time for you. Yes. And time is critical when you're running something like FT8 Correct. or Whisper yes. or one of the JTS, uh, excuse me, WSJTX modes, I should say. Correct. Yes. You were mentioning something earlier uh, briefly about audio, and I don't know if you wanted to return to that, a question about uh, the Pi and audio interfacing. Correct. Yes. On the Pi, there is a small eighth-inch stereo jack, which is used for audio out. And that's great if you want to listen to something. And I believe you can assign it. If you said, well, I need an audio in, you have to go into the settings to say this is like an input line. But if you're running a digital mode, like uh, FT8 or, yes. or even PSK31, you really can't use that single jack because it has to be either or. It can't be both at the same time. And it would be hard to configure the program to say, well, on this moment it's, receive, it's line in, on this moment it's line out. So you have to consider using an external sound card. And what I have on mine is the little USB sound card that just kind of plugs in there and it gives me a line in and a line out. Specifically, this gives me a microphone in and a line out. So now if I want to run digital modes, I can just make my two connections to that little USB sound card mm -hmm. and not have to worry about assigning that secondary port for either line in or line out. 
One approach I also used was I use with my Pi a USB sound device, one of those little tiny USB sound devices. Yes. And I plugged it into the USB port, and then I had a sound device for both in and out, which was convenient. Yes, and that's what I have on mine, yes. Before we get to the end, I want to ask the obvious question. <laughs> For amateur radio applications, I already have a desktop computer or a laptop computer. Why should I care about the Pi? Because it's cool. <laughs> and I know that sounds corny, but it's all part of that experimentation. I mean, that's what keeps amateur radio alive. At least it's one of the things it does, mm -hmm. is the ability for us to evolve and to experiment with all this new technology and see how we can incorporate it into amateur radio. In my case... Yes, I have a laptop I, that I can bring with me. I have a desktop that I can use. But with the Pi, not only is it a great demonstration piece, especially if you're out in the field, but it's just that technology that we're adapting for amateur radio use. Yes. And thankfully, like with when the personal computer first hit homes, ham radio operators said, oh, we definitely have to marry this into amateur radio. They did that with the Pi. Yes. And there are dozens and dozens of software packages built specifically for the Raspberry Pi. The other cool thing about it is it's all free because yes. it's all open source. You do not have to pay a registration. It's not a demo or anything like that. Yeah, it's no cost free. for the software. No cost for the software. And this stuff actually does work. Now, mine, I'm currently using FL Digi, which is a multi-mode program. Granted, it is the Linux version, but it's the Linux version that works just fine on the Raspberry Pi. So I, you could use that to run uh, anything from PSK31 to CW, uh, Feldhell, if you want to play with that, yeah. Olivia, MFSK16, any one of the current digital modes supported by FL Digi, you can run on the Raspberry Pi. Now, you had mentioned FT8 earlier, and yes. that's WSJTX. I run that on this Pi, too. Only thing is that you have to be careful about what version of Linux you're running. With the current version of WSJTX, which is version 2.0, it will not run properly on earlier flavors of, say, the Raspbian, like Jesse. I found, and I only found this out because I went on groups and said, why can't I run the current version of WSJTX mm -hmm. on my Pi? It seems that it needs Stretch, which is the another version of the Raspbian software. Oh, yes. So you... Yeah, there's a few ways you can do it. You can either burn a new uh, micro SD card, or if you're brave like me, just try to overwrite it and hope for the best, in which I was able to. I was able to pretty much overwrite the operating system while the Pi was running into this stretch version, and then I can install WSJTX version 2.0 and run FT8. Now, that kind of goes back to that whole issue with the time syncing, because for those in our audience who know about the JT modes and FT8, it is extremely time critical. Oh, you bet. You, you can't yes. be, what, a second uh, off oh, if that? Yeah, I mean, preferably a about a half a second Half a so, second. Yes. So you want to make sure that the time is always in sync, and that's where that Pi clock sure. really helps. I've heard of some hams who are dedicating their Raspberry Pi to Whisper. Yes. They're, they're running propagation beacons or they're receiving Whisper with their Raspberry Pi, and that frees up their primary computer, their laptop or their desktop, for other uses. So that's a, really a very practical application of the Pi. It is. In fact, not to brag, but... <laughs> About two years, I was tasked with developing a whisper transmitter that we can send out for portable use. And it's built into a nice little yellow Pelican-style case. It has a 12-volt, 7-amp-hour battery associated with it. And when the thing boots up, it will automatically run the whisper program on 20 meters. Oh. So all I have to do is, if we know it's going to be sent off to some place, I have to configure the program with the the grid square and how much power you want to run and so forth and it does it just does it on 20 meters in the pi itself i have both the pi clock because of the time but i also have the 20 meter hat which is the filter because this thing will essentially transmit across the band oh it, yeah it, it kind of sets this frequency it's but kind you, of a signal generator yeah, it, <laughs> exactly and it can be used as a signal generator yes. But that 20-meter Pi 
the hat actually fits right over it. It fits over the pie clock, and that acts as a filter so our transmissions are pretty much just within the 20-meter whisper yes. frequency, and it's all in milliwatts, really. Well, thank you very much, Joe. It's been very informative. You're most welcome. If you have a question for the doctor, email us at doctor at ARRL.org. The Doctor is In podcast is sponsored by DX Engineering at www.dxengineering.com. Background music provided by Purple Planet at www.purple-planet.com. This podcast is copyright ARRL. All rights are reserved. Until next time, I'm QST Managing Editor Becky Schoenfeld, W1BXY, 73, and thanks for listening. Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald. Alle mail is welkom op het adres x xdvme Dat is ook te vinden rechts bovenaan de webpagina van de uitzending in www.pa0ete.nl. De Daily Minutes toont iedere dag weer aan de hand van schokkende voorbeelden hoe een hobby mensenlevens kan veranderen. De internetfaciliteiten en studio hardware voor Daily Minutes worden gesponsord door 70 megahertzshop.nl. 70 mhzshop.nl. Program 89 of Shortwave Radiogram. I'm Kim Andrew Elliott in Arlington, Virginia, USA. On Shortwave Radiogram, we transmit digital text and images on an analog shortwave broadcast transmitter. For more information about our project, swradiogram.net. That's swradiogram.net. On today's program, text in MFSK32 and MFSK64. News about recycling small glass fragments commentary about global internet from satellites, and this week's images. First, the program preview in MFSK 32. That's MFSK 32.
Ja, Mikrofon nach Dorf.